Signore e signori, buonasera. Benvenuti at this virtual Casa Italiana for the presentation of The Shadow King, Maza Mengiste's latest book. And we are very excited because we have this wonderful panel tonight that includes uh, the author of the book, Maza Mengiste, and Ruth Mengia. Uh, I congratulate Maza for the publication of the book and for the many accolades, awards, and prizes that the book has received and for which it has been uh, nominated. Uh, the latest one I found out about is The Flying Whale. It's a new prize connected with the Le Conversazioni Literary Festival that takes place in Capri. And I understand that the award will be given there. So I take it as an appointment to go to Capri next summer for this uh, very special recognition of Mazda's incredible uh, writing work. And uh, my job for the evening as host of, the, uh, of this evening is just to remind you that we have an ongoing series that we started uh, this semester uh, called Virtual Salons, Conversations in Black Italian. Of course, the, you will find out why uh, Mata Mengista's book is related to some of the issues we are discussing in this series that we just started, co-curated by Angelica Pesarini of NYU Florence and Candice Whitney. And it's an ongoing series. We had a first uh, installment and there are more coming. Check out our website to find out more about it. And tonight, uh, as I mentioned, we have Ruth Benguia. Uh, Ruth is a dear friend and a wonderful colleague. She is a professor of uh, Italian studies and history at New York Univer University. And we are very proud to have her on the faculty. Um, her main interests are uh, fascism, um, propaganda, cinema, and she published extensively both academic books uh, in academic magazines, but more recently her life and her career took a turn because of, exactly because of the kind of interest that she has. And you find uh, her articles on CNN, more recently an article in, uh, New York, in the New Yorker that just came out yesterday, I think, entitled, What Happens When Strong Men Get Sick? And we are really looking forward to the uh, presentation of her new book, Strong Man from Mussolini to the Present, that we are going to present here on the virtual channel of Casa Italiana in a tutti a casa with historian Mauro Canali. And that's going to be November 19th for Ruth ben Ghiat's book, Strong Man from Mussolini to the Present. There are going to be the elections in the middle. There is going to be a lot to say about Ruth's book her interpretations of history and of the present. And tonight we have the fortune of having these two great scholars and authors discussing Mata Mengiste's book. I've done my job. Uh, there is actually another woman that is gonna be present and she's the protagonist of Mata's book. So I leave you to these three formidable women. Enjoy mm -hmm. your evening. I'm gonna be here with you listening to them. Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And I'm so delighted to be here to introduce uh, Maza Mengiste, a friend and colleague. Um, she's a professor of creative writing at Queens College, an acclaimed writer who has received uh, Fulbright, uh, National Endowment of the Arts, and many other fellowships and awards, uh, including a, a literature award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She's the author of Beneath the Lion's Gaze in 2010 and now The Shadow King, uh, which is shortlisted for the Booker Prize and has received rave reviews. Um, and Maza is going to uh, talk about the book and, and read from it, I believe, and then I will uh, make a comment and ask her a few questions. We'll discuss and we'll take some questions from you. So Maza. Yes, uh, Ruth, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you, Stefano, um, all of you for inviting me. I feel like, Ruth, we've been in conversation about this book from the very beginning, uh, from when I, I first started writing it. You were so helpful to me with suggesting resources and people I could speak to. So um, this is a public thank you. I, I, it really... Um, You've been a part of this process. I, I'm going to read a, a brief section of my book. Uh, you know, maybe I'll start at the beginning. 
because uh, I was going to read another part, but if there's time maybe for that, we can do that. Mm -hmm. But I will read from this where we first begin, become introduced to the war and maybe the after effects of the war. And this is from the first pages of The Shadow King. Uh, the book is set in 1935 and begins really with Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. But uh, the book itself begins in 1974, 40 years after um, the invasion and the war. And uh, I'll just read it. It's the first page and then we can go from there. 1974. She does not want to remember, but she is here and memory is gathering bones. She has come by foot and by bus to Addis Ababa. Across terrain she has chosen to forget for nearly 40 years. She is two days early, but she will wait for him, seated on the ground in this corner of the train station, the metal box on her lap, her back pressed against the wall, rigid as a sentinel. She has put on the dress she does not wear every day. Her hair is neatly braided and sleek, and she has been careful to hide the long scar that puckers at the base of her neck and trails over her shoulder like a broken necklace. In the box are his letters, le lettere, o sepolto le mie lettere, El mio segreto, Hirut, anche il tuo segreto. Segreto, secret, mister. You must keep them for me until I see you again. Now go, hurry before they catch you. There are newspaper clippings with dates spanning the course of the war between her country and his. She knows he has arranged them from the start, 1935, to nearly the end, 1941. In the box are photographs of her, those he took on Fucelli's orders and labeled in his own neat handwriting, una bella ragazza, una soldata feroce, and those he took of his own free will, memento scavenged from the life of the frightened young woman she was in that prison, behind that barbed wire fence, trapped in terrifying nights that she could not free herself from. Inside the box are the many dead that insist on resurrection. She has traveled for five days to get to this place. She has pushed her way through checkpoints and nervous soldiers, past frightened villagers whispering of a coming revolution and violent student protests. She has watched while a parade of young women raising fists and rifles marched past the bus taking her to Bahardar. They stared at her, an aging woman in her long drab dress, as if they did not know those who came before them, as if this were the first time a woman carried a gun, as if the ground beneath their feet had not been won by some of the greatest fighters Ethiopia had ever known. Women named Aster, Nardos, Ababech, Dabru, Ababa, Kuddist, Saba, and a woman simply called the cook. Hirut murmured the names of those women as, she, as the students marched past, each utterance hurling her back in time until she was once again on ragged terrain, choking in fumes and gunpowder, suffocating in the pungent stench of poison. She was brought back to the present, to the bus, only after one old man grabbed her by the arm as he took a seat next to her. If Mussolini couldn't get rid of the emperor, what do these students think they are doing now? Hirut shook her head. She shakes her head again. She has come this far to return this box, to rid herself of the horror that staggers back unbidden. She has come to give up the ghosts and drive them away. She has no time for questions. She has no time to correct an old man's pronunciation. One name always drags with it another. Nothing travels alone. And I'll, I'll stop there. It's so beautiful. Um, and and I, I hope you'll read uh, another part of the book after. Yeah. Um, so for those who um, haven't uh, got 
to read the book yet. Um, it's, it's about Ethiopian resistance against Mussolini's occupation, which lasted from 1935 to 1941. It's about female resistance fighters like the protagonist. Um, it's also about the place of history in images and the place of images in history and the inconveniences of memory. So one of the first you know, lines is that she doesn't want to remember. And this inconvenience of memory is felt by uh, both Italians and Ethiopians uh, at, at different times. So I wanna start my comment in, in this realm. Um, in the 1990s, when I was at the Instituto Luce's photo archive, and the Instituto Luce figures in this novel, it figures in the history of fascism, it was the, um, the, age, the huge bureaucracy agency established to make nonfiction film, newsreels, documentaries, photographs. It was the lens through which Italians experienced uh, their own history of those 20 years and also what happened abroad, uh, the places that uh, Italy invaded. So I was in the photo archive and I was asking for images of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. And I'd known the archivist for some years. Um, we would have lunch together when I came there and we were on friendly terms. So after kind of pondering for a few minutes, he disappeared. He came back a few minutes later with two large rusted boxes marked AOI, Africa Orientale Italiana, or the East African Empire. And no one had opened them for who knows how long. And so he couldn't open them and he had to go get a crowbar <clears throat> and force them open. And there were pictures of marches, there were pictures of humanitarian actions, you know, inoculating babies, classic colonial uh, <laughs> stuff, um, battle scenes and pictures of mutilated Italian corpses. There were no pictures of mutilated Ethiopian or other corpses. And because no one had looked at these photos, they were all dusty again, he had to you know, pry it open. That day I experienced the thrill of the archive, um, the sense of anticipation at finding documents or visual or written that expose you to something new. But I also remember feeling a bit overwhelmed and also very much my position as someone who is neither Italian nor Ethiopian. Um, an American of, of Scottish Israeli heritage coming into these histories. And I remember feeling um, not, not quite sure what to do with these images. I didn't remember which one should I request for copies, which one should I forget about, right? And I was reminded of this moment and reading The Shadow King, uh, which starts with, as you heard, it was perfect to start with this, with photographs in a box that you know uh, are fraught. Uh, it's a fraught memory. And Mazo writes uh, of this box of Hirut, the dead pulse beneath the lid. This is an example of the very powerful writing which is everywhere in this book. And in this case, it opens up a painful personal you know, history for her and obviously for her country. And of course your novel, Maza, for many readers is an exposure to something new. It's a box that's pried open, right? These are histories that many people still don't know about, mm -hmm. um, even if they were aware that there was an occupation and it's an occupation that's still defined by the conqueror's words, by the conqueror's images, by Instituto Luce's images. Um, if you Google, uh, you know, the Italian occupation of Ethiopia, many of the images that come up are Instituto Luce images. So, so that's casually what you see. And it's an occupation whose many terrors were left out of Italian accounts uh, for many decades. It's something no one wanted to talk about. And an occupation that spawned a resistance that's been told only partially. It's the memory box of, of women who combated the fascists having remained closed for many Ethiopians as well. So there's many layers of discovery that are um, 
are are active in in your book. It's like an exhumation. So I'm also grateful to images because they brought us together. And years ago, you contacted me. This is how we met. Um, Maza contacted me to give some historical <laughs> context because she, she had bought a, an album of an Italian soldier. Correct me if I mm -hmm. wrong. A personal album that he had of his, um, you know, time in Ethiopia. And our fr friendship began at a coffee shop, looking over these pictures that sometimes left so much untold. So this, out of this came in 2012, a conference we did together on the legacies of the Italian occupation. And it was precisely about how poetry and performance and writing and photography and other arts express this part of Ethiopian history that has been difficult to find a way into um, narrative, let's mm -hmm. say into nonfiction narrative, into histories. So the Shadow King reminds us that the sense of time and its unfolding that structure history is very subjective. Um, and this is what our conference was about too. There's a circular time of trauma that is, that is active in the book. Mm -hmm. And then there's a seamless time of ancestral lineages and connections that make themselves felt at different moments. So, so Maza is very depth, deftly weaving in, there's conqueror's time, there's uh, the time of waiting of the resistance and the time of uh, the, the, the awfulness of um, whether it's, it's fighters in Ethiopia or Haile Selassie in exile, this kind of time of dread um, and then the time of after, which is what she, she started with. And um, also this idea that the regime had of time and history as inevitable victory, something useless to oppose. Mm -hmm. And so very much that's in this book, uh, a sense of mm -hmm. fighting back um, something that's supposed to be impossible to resist. Um, and Mussolini said in his speech announcing the invasion in October 1935 that those who go against, quote, the wheel of destiny will be ejected from history. So, the <laughs> rota del for, de fortuna, I think, or del destino. And your novel restores the place of those who were doubly object, uh, ejected because they were Ethiopian fighters and also many of them women. Um, so I'm really grateful to you and it's such a beautiful novel. And so my first question to you is, how did the process of writing the book change your view of what becomes history and what stays <sighs> hidden? Um, it's, the whole book is grappling with, again, what was the quote you started with, you know, what, what we don't want to remember. Yeah, wow. Um... You know, I think the whole process, the, when I first started writing the book, I, um, I really thought I was going to be writing the history as I knew it as a child, which was a story of uh, Ethiopian patriots charging against a well-equipped Italian army, um, but the Ethiopians were poorly equipped, had old outdated guns, had their spears, uh, and somehow five years later they won. And I thought that this was, I thought this was the war, but it wasn't until I started researching that I began to realize, wait, those men were not charging 24 hours a day, seven days a week for five years. You know, what what happened in between the battles? What was life like? How, you know, Italians were there for five years. I knew that my grandfather spoke a little bit of Italian when I was a child. How did that happen? Um, what, were the, what were the relationships that built up between Italian men and Ethiopian East African women? Um, what were those things that the women would never speak about? And what were the things they could readily speak about? I never heard those stories. So, um, and going into those archives that you talked about, Ruth, I, um, <laughs> you know, the Luce, those Luce 
files, my God, you, you know, you, I was watching them in Rome when I was, uh, you know, when I was there, I would go to the Discoteca di Stato to listen to some of the speeches, the songs that, that were being recorded in 1935, 36, um, sang by Eritreans, Ethiopian, Somali. And I realized though very early, which was, I think, um, what you were also saying that wait this is a this is a very curated history where what where's the real what's the story of what happened in between the battles where's the Italian perspective of that how you know how are all these uh, you know children who are half Italian born if there's no record of that in the archives if there's no mention of these kinds of relationships what was happening here um i started talking to friends of mine who are italian um i started started uh, you know i living there i was asking them what was it like for your relatives mm -hmm. i i remember i had an italian um friend and she was uh, helping me tutoring me and she said her uncle or her grandfather went to war an ethiopian came back and she said but maza ethiopia is a wall in my family mm -hmm. and we never we don't cross that wall even then she could not you know she didn't do it um and that I found to be really an interesting uh, perspective or reality of this war that Italians could not speak of it. And then it feels like, well, if you can't speak of it, what really happened? What was really happening? Um, I had this experience in uh, when I was living there, I went on tour for my first book. Mm. Um, beneath the lion's gaze, and I was going to Calabria. I went to Calabria to talk about that book. And, you know, I had a feeling that something, I knew that the southern part of Italy really sent a lot of men or a lot of men went to the war. They were the foot soldiers, whereas the northerners were the officers. They may not have had, you know, as much contact with Ethiopians, the foot soldiers came from the south. They were poor. They were the ones without education. Um, they fought. And I said, I wonder if I'm going to find any, any remnant of this history there. In, and, um, you know, I was there, my event that night in a very small bookshop. We were talking about 1974 and the revolution. Then it came time for questions. And one man stood up and he said, I want to talk about 1935. Mm. And the entire room went quiet. Mm. And you could hear people stiffen. And they turned to him and they said, we're this is not the, you know, we're talking about this. He goes, no. And he started getting emotional then. And he said, no, my father was a pilot in that war. And then he became really emotional and he turned to me and he said, my father dropped the bombs on your people. Mm. How can I ask for your forgiveness? Mm. And he, he started crying at that point and I didn't know what to say. Um, and, you know, the only response I could give at that moment, because the room, if you can imagine the emotion in that room, uh, was this is how we do it now by creating this dialogue, by starting to speak about these things. And he said, please don't leave until I come back. He rushed out, came back with a self-published um, book of his. It was just basically his father's photographs, letters, journal entries that he had photocopied and put into a book and he gave it to me and he said, do with it what you want. And I came back to Rome from that thinking this is where the history is. Mm -hmm. But in the artifacts that these men kept for themselves that they didn't think anybody would look at. Uh, he told me that his father kept this in a box 
and he would never speak of his time in Ethiopia. And it was only when his father died that he opened the box. He was able to get it and see what was inside. Um, I was trying to figure out while I lived in Rome, okay, where is this place? Where do I look? And I think E.G. is here, Ijaba Shago. And we started going to Porta Portese. We started, you know, I was going to these fascist tables yeah, yeah. and these markets, right? And I soon was going into every, every town I was in, these small towns. When I was in Firenze, I would go to Abruzzo. You know, I would go in, in Trieste. Every small town I, I went to, I would go for these flea markets. And, you know, Ruth, in every flea market, there's a table for Mussolini. All I had to do was look for Mussolini's head. <laughs> and you know that's where I would go um, and that's really where the the book began with those personal stories that these yeah. men kept for themselves it was not necessarily in Luce um, and you know that's one side but this was the intimate personal reality of what war is like and it really uh, it opened up the book and the, the war for me yeah, that's very powerful. That's yeah. That's um that's and the fact that had you been a, an Italian speaking in that occasion th this probably wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So it, yeah. It's also the importance of um who who is who is writing mm. history and who has the power of making uh, connect, emotional connections that bring forth memories. Okay. And that kind of leads to my um, my other question for you. So for those who haven't read it yet, there's, there's a lot in the book about the implications of um, taking images, like, you know, take for yourself, mm -hmm. right? As part of conquest and this relationship between the possession of images and the possession of territory mm -hmm. and bodies. Um, and without those newsreels and photographs, the occupation would have been unknown, but th that's the public history. But also what Maza just said, these were artifacts that, that people kept for themselves about their kind of public slash private life as soldiers and workers in Ethiopia. And there's a lot of calling attention in the novel, uh, it's done very beautifully, to parallels between acts of violence and the taking of mm. pictures, this, this, um, these different kinds of imperial aggressions. Um, and there's a memorable passage in which there is uh, a, a resistance fighter has just been hung and the body is there. And there's a protagonist, Ettore, who's a photographer, and he's a very interesting character, and many reviewers have remarked on this, that he is a Jewish Italian. So he ends up, and this is, uh, part of it is during the, the, the racial laws are being passed at home, so he is in this liminal position. He's a part of the imperial aggressors, but he is... Um, his family is becoming a, a victim you know, themselves. So you say that uh, the hanged man still, I'm paraphrasing, it's not, mm -hmm. she writes it in a much more beautiful manner, that the hanged man is still there with the rope around his neck and Ettore still has his camera slung around his neck with the straps. So there, there are many uh, parallels drawn. Um, so you've already talked a little bit about this, but. I, I just wanted to ask you how important, and this is a question about the creative process, how important was the, the act of looking at these pictures mm -hmm. and thinking about um, what it means to take pictures and take memories? How, how important was that in the creation of the book? Mm. It was, I mean, it was absolutely central. The question of photography and who is taking the photograph? Who is being photographed? Maybe um, if we can pull up, um, there are two photos I would like to, to talk about now, but one of them is a group of officers. One of them has a camera. If we can, if we can look at this, um, this was one of my first, uh, in, you know, it, it brought home to me 
the 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 way that the camera was was really present in this war. Uh, you see these officers, you see that person with the camera, but you also have to understand that someone is taking a photograph of this, you know? So there are two people here with a photograph, um, with a camera, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, they're well aware, at least these men are well aware of what the camera is supposed to capture, its intent, and the way that power can be projected through a photograph the way that they could remake themselves by the way that they posed, by the clothes that they wear, um, just by somebody taking an image. This is a photograph of Italian power, of masculinity, of fascism. I think Ruth, you and I have talked about, you know, these poses that yes. that's also very typical Mussolini. I was that, just thinking the same thing, the arms akimbo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the legs, uh, you know, and it's all there. And yeah. it's the, the camera, the person, the camera is, the lens is pointed right at that person with his arm on his waist, the two, you know, his hands on his waist. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's up on a hill. So it's being shot from overhead. And that angle is also very deliberate. You know, it's, um, it's so that people can gaze. It's as if you're gazing down in a way, but it's going to center him completely. Yeah. Uh, and that, this was a really, um, I, I've, I kept coming back to this when I was rendering Carlo Fucelli in the book. Um, and then if we could go to the next image with the, the two men, this one, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I titled the book The Shadow King, because it references something else in the book, but my character, Ettore, who is a soldier, Italian Jew, who brings his camera to war, um, is photographing scenes of atrocity. He's photographing Italians with their captured prisoners. Here, the presence and the power of that photographer felt very apparent and obvious to me. That this is a, this is a photograph that is not it's not about the man who's probably Ethiopian, maybe he's Eritrean, I'm not sure, East African, definitely. But it's not about him. It's about the Italians involved in the, in the making of this image. It's about the Italian standing next to him, and it's about the Italian who's making this image. This is, a, again, about who can be in the presence of an Ethiopian and not be killed. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that this man is the Ethiopian or Eritrean man has his arms folded across his chest, feels to me like a, um, it's a gesture of fear, of discomfort, maybe of pain, maybe something has happened to him mm -hmm. just before this. Um, all of this, uh, this photo is another one I kept coming to, but the Shadow King mm -hmm. speaks also to, to the photographer, you know, the, the person who controls light and shadow and stands in that dark place mm -hmm. in order to render these images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very powerful. And let's not forget that uh, one of Mussolini's uh, favorite ways to pose, he had many, mm -hmm. uh, was looking through a movie camera. And so the very famous huge mock-up when they were inaugurating Cinecittà Mm -hmm. uh, where he was this giant figure who was looking through a movie camera and underneath it said cinema is the, the, the strongest weapon of the regime. But he was above all, he was truly gigantic. So this omnipotence and he sees all. Um, and so the regime in so many ways, and it's a surveillance state, it's a police state. And that transposed was transposed in Ethiopia. So the camera... Um, I mean, you're very right to, the, you know, the camera brought out fear um, because just as people are, um, you know, photographed as part of detention, um, who knows what, what, uh, what the taking of a picture is a prelude to taking other things, especially also for women, um, the sexual violence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you stood out enough to be photographed, you could also find yourself, uh, 
you know, a target of, of other kinds of aggressions. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, maybe we can go to the, there's an image, uh, I think it'd be really interesting to talk about, um, that's the, uh, the Italians around a big table. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Because as soon as you said aggressions, I <laughs> wanted to also think about this, because this is that other side of war. You know, this is, there's the aggression that's outside this room. Um, outside those windows, who knows what's happening, but inside this space, there's also this other side that I was really, I had to work to capture, which was the camaraderie, the friendships, maybe lifelong friendships that, that were created during this war. Um, but as much, as many times as I've looked at this, you know, and I have, I, I would love to, to also talk about what you might notice, Ruth, um, I noticed the wine, the guitar, the way that this is a, a party, maybe celebrating something. And yet there are those two men that, uh, in the, my lower left corner who are refusing to turn to the camera. Mm. And that for me feels like these small acts of defiance that I would see again and again in different photographs of people who just would not either they refused to be photographed face on or would turn their head or would would make sure they moved so they would be blurred at just yeah. the right moment this photo is celebratory but there's something deeply frightening but at the same time complicated because there's friendship there uh and this is something that i really work to capture uh in the book that these men maybe loved each other as much as they did other things. Yeah. And, and this is one thing uh, that stands out in the novel and many reviewers have talked about that your character, whether they're, whatever side they're on, they're very complex. Um, they're not at all one dimensional and they're capable of, you know, humane acts and then savage acts, mm -hmm. uh, which really makes makes the novel a really rich tapestry and, and more authentic to the way things actually played out on the ground, I, I would say. But that's a very haunting uh, photo of this celebration and then these, these, these two people who are very still. And, and I found that when I, when I was uh, doing the research in, for the book on um, uh, fascism's empire cinema, mm -hmm. and I tried to find moments in newsreels uh, and documentaries that were about showing Italy the the men who'd been conquered, and um, you know, then if you went close up, the, the people you know are they're not they're not behaving for the camera, and so there's a disjuncture between the the music and the narrator, which is all about conquest, and then the actual gaze that uh, the subject is is turning to the camera, and I found those acts of resistance very powerful. Yeah. Um, so do you want to read another passage? We have, we have time sure. and then we can see what's going on in the chat. Yes, um, I could read a f the photo part. There's a, f you know, we can talk about that. This is this, that moment that you mentioned in, a, in earlier of um, an Ethiopian who has been captured and he has been killed, he's been hanged. And Ettore is, has been ordered to photograph the body. And then <clears throat> after that, the Colonel Fucelli has given everyone money to go to a bar and mm -hmm. get drunk. So I'll read those. And then I'll read the photo, the photo part first. Um, photo. He is a body suspended in the mean play of light a figure deformed by obedient shadows. There he hangs in a beam of dying sun, held up by a tree bowing from his weight. See his head and its bloom of curly hair, the shorn ear that appears like a dip on a narrow jaw. What is plain to see, a neck arching horribly, the spine distended, a mother's son pinned against a ripe afternoon sky. Behind him, the valley shrinks from the eager eyes of uniformed men. And what are they, after all, 
but the other sons of other mothers, and he the glorious proof of their mechanized ambitions. What we see, a boy pulled into manhood, a soaring body held back by gravitational laws. See him stretch against this terrifying rope. Note the legs that kick against the downward tug. Behold the rebellious silhouette spinning in a burning sun. And there, see him too, at the edge of the frame, the taker of this photograph, the thief of this moment. There he is, almost out of view, made visible in the shadow, stretching toward the elevated feet, a dark figure of a man firmly in focus, the camera pointed toward that defamation. Now they are here in the bar that Fucelli reserved for them, a tiny touch bait in the center of Dabark, nothing more than a single room with a corrugated tin roof, a series of chairs and a large unsteady table balance on a dirt floor covered with lemongrass and frayed rugs. It is the end of a long day. The prisoner still hangs from the tree. Ettore's camera still dangles from his neck. Two exposed rolls of film still poke in his pocket against his leg. There is ample evidence that he is here, outside of Gondar, in this bar far from home, and yet he cannot erase the image of his father stepping into the room, a stack of photographs gripped in his hand while looking for answers. Ettore rubs his head. He has had several beers and the waitress is bringing more but it is only his father's voice that he hears. The cramped bar pulses with the commanding energy of Leo Navarra and his accented voice, the one he uses at home when there is no restraint in what he can say, when every voice that comes from his mouth is exactly what he intends. But have you answered my question, my son? Do you know what you would see if you sat in a dark windowless bar in the middle of an African city and a girl were to walk toward you with a bottle of beer? What would you see, Ettore, if you turned in your seat to observe Mario and the others beckoning this waitress who was moving toward them in her native dress and lowered eyes? Is the body in shadow or in light? Remember, son, you are not home. There is no poetry in this place. There is no honorable stare that happens between these walls. Son, you who are here in this bar, crammed full of soldiers drilling this girl with their eyes while a young man hangs, what do you have to say? I say the eye will hold in itself the image of a luminous body better than that of a shadowed object. I say, Father, the eye has the power to keep what it sees. The eye is greedy. The eye will always seek and devour that illumined figure made visible by predatory light. Fofi says, did you see him? Did you see the way he was smiling even when I pointed my gun at him from the ground? Fofi says, did you see the way he tried to act tough and stare at me even after they tightened the rope? Fofi says, did you get a picture of me next to his feet, Ettore? Can we call you photo? Everyone laughs, Mario the loudest, and Ettore nods and he laughs and raises his camera and points it at Fofi and he says, I'm going to shoot you now. And it is funny, father. It is a joke. And so we laugh and we spend that night around that table telling jokes and miming faces so we do not hear the fresh cries coming from the villagers, their voices a ripple extending from the horizon to the ends of the earth. Because, father, this is war. Is this war? Fofi asks, as Mario buys him another beer. This is not even war, Giulio says, but he is not laughing. And Ettore orders another beer, and they watch the waitress balancing the tray of beers while dodging hands. And when she comes to their table, she glances at the camera, and she says, no photo. And mm -hmm. Fofi laughs again and points at Ettore and says, no photo and they drink their beers while Giulio keeps standing up and going to the door and checking outside. And I was glad on that day, Father. I was happy. And I'll stop there. Mm. 
So beautiful. And, and um, those listening can get a, a small taste of the absolutely uh, hypnotic rhythm of Maza's writing. And um, I, I can't even do it justice in words. It's just so, so elegiac, so beautiful. And, and so you see that throughout there's this interplay of um, different points of view, different histories, different memories, um, and not exactly privileging any one, although the novel is clearly written to um, call our attention to some histories that have been way more sub submerged than others. Um, <clears throat> but this, this quote, the eye has the power to keep what it sees. That's just the perfect um, poetic rendering of all this theory about imperial possession and photography. It's just, there's so, it's such a rich novel. Um, it's, 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 it's stupendous. Thank it really you. is. It really is. And I guess the last thing I want to um, comment on is, so Ettore's father was a, uh, he fled Eastern Europe yeah. and he came to Italy. So he is living in exile. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a sub theme of comings and goings, people going into exile. There's from, of course, Haile Selassie, who then comes mm -hmm. home. And 1974, another moment when many people had to go into exile or we're, we're going to you know, be preparing to go. And so the theme of movement. Um, and uh, being in exile and being at a remove from things you love mm -hmm. and thus having to keep in your mind's eye um, uh, memories you know, of, of, your, of your past, you, you're, you're disconnected from them and all you have is a box maybe. Yeah. Um, I found that very powerful. Um, I ended up uh, in writing my, my book, Strong Men, which is about it's kind of a history of the evolution of authoritarian regimes, starting with Mussolini. Mm -hmm. uh, exile ended up being a theme. Yeah, I, I felt it was time to write about um, that. You know, there's nations come together under these strongmen, but then there's a parallel nations that that of exiles. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated how you um, that such a it's a, it's an important theme. Um, of being torn away from your country and rendering so vividly what happens when you're in a foreign occupation. Um, yeah, I really, you know, I found um, once I started thinking about uh, all the laws that Mussolini was setting into place, you know, beginning and uh, starting from, I mean, we let's say just 1935, 36, 37, then seeing the you know the racial segregation laws that took effect in Ethiopia in 1937 and then by 1938 we had this anti-semitic laws that that were that were in effect and i you know i was really fascinated by that what happened to the italian jewish population who were in the military who were on um, who were in africa you know, those who were in Libya, those who were in East Africa, what, you know, how did they begin to grapple with the complicated place that, that these laws had put them in? Um, and once I, I thought I, I really would like to address some of this history, um, I was reading, I can't remember now what book I was reading during research, and it the the there was a mention of you know Italians who had fled or not Italians the Jewish people I guess they became Italian Jews who fled the pogroms in Russia in yeah. Ukraine and settled in Italy mm -hmm. and uh, I believe like Alessandro Stile's family had also done that um, and I thought my God the speaking of exile and the way that these strong men, the way that violence creates new nations, just exactly the way you're talking, it, um, that was really the, the motivation and inspiration to, to mention the Ukraine because yeah. there are 
There are new generations, new nations, new worlds that will be born as a result of what's happening right now, but it was also exactly. happening in 35 and, and before that. And we, yeah. And, and we like to put, um, we like to keep these things separate. We think that yeah. what happens in Ukraine has nothing at all to do with uh, Italian Libya or Ethiopia or Italian Jews. And instead there's a, there's a whole history of intertwining and, re and repeated exiles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and choices that might not make sense to outsiders, yeah. um, like people who flee a dictatorship but then temporarily settle in another dictatorship, um, <laughs> or or somebody like your character who can't go home. Yeah. He and he, I don't want to yeah. give it all away, but he can't go home because if he goes home, he's going to be uh, a target of the racial laws. Yeah, and you so. you know, we have the, the Italian word, l'insabiati, See, this was this is a phenomenon. It was happening so much that there was a, a term for it. And I wanted to um, you know, to no pun intended, but to dig into that history a little yeah. bit more and see I mean, and this is there's still so much to explore in yeah. all of this. Yeah, no. Um so I think we are kind of out of time. Um I don't see any questions for the yeah. moment. So uh, yeah, this is, as you see, this book connects to um, so many histories mm. that it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a kind of roadmap. It's, it's a work of extremely yeah. beautiful literature, but it's also, I'm speaking as a historian now, it's a roadmap to connections and histories that uh, as Maza just said, are really very little explored. Um, so I urge everybody to to read it. Um, and it's been, there's a reason it's been so lauded and thank you for writing it. Oh, thank you. Effort. Thank you for your help with, I mean, uh, over the years, I remember that, that meeting in the cafe yeah. and... <laughs> My gosh, that's, it was it was really one of those moments that, uh, you know, it, it helped me write this book. So I really appreciate that. And, and likewise, your, your investigations are, I, I don't, uh, I hadn't exactly planned to write an entire book on Italian fascist imperial uh, images, but I did. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone who tuned yeah, in. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. I see some friends. So really, um, ciao. A ciao. Tutti. A tutti. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.